Okay, let's start at a story, um, and you're going to need this story. This story is from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Uh, do you remember how God's people were in slavery in Egypt? Anybody remember that? They were in slavery in Egypt, and it was a terrible thing, and, and God sent Moses to go and free his people out of Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt. And just to really summarize the story down, there were all these plagues, miracles of judgment that God brought against the Egyptians, trying to get their attention, trying to get his people out of Egypt. And whenever God did one of these miracles, and like there's a crazy miracle of frogs, you know, like they got overwhelmed with frogs. You're like, well, that doesn't sound too bad. But then most of their animals died, and then and there was darkness, and then there was all, all the water turned to blood. There's all this stuff. But in every single one of them, if you read the text closely, it says that God sent it against the Egyptians, but his people were in the land of Goshen. And the plague didn't hit in Goshen because God was protecting his people. Except for the last plague. And God comes to Moses and says, I'm going to do one final plague. And the destroyer is going to come, he says. The destroyer is going to come to every single house. And when the destroyer comes, by the next morning, someone in the house will be dead. And on this one, it, it was different. It was special because God treated every house the same, Egyptians and Israelites. What he said was, Israelites, if you don't want to have someone perish in the night, you need to slaughter a lamb and you need to make a sacrifice. And you'll take the lamb's blood and you'll put it across your doorpost. Maybe this is too violent for you this morning. But this is historical. This is what happened. And when they put the blood of the lamb across the doorpost, they called it the Passover. And the lamb died instead of the members of the household. By the, end, by the next morning, someone was going to be dead. That's what God's saying. And Israelites, you're just as sinful as they are. And in that moment, God treated all humanity the same. And we're going to see that today. So the miracle happened and the, the, the angel of death passed over the Israelite households. And God instituted what's called the Passover feast. And every Jewish family from that point forward, once a year, is supposed to celebrate the Passover feast. And they have for centuries and centuries. And if you know anything about the Passover feast, they get together and there's, there's some very specific elements in the Passover feast and they celebrate those elements. And the very first one is the matzah bread. It's the unleavened bread. And what they do is they call that the bread of our affliction. They say, this, this is the bread of our affliction. And it's not sinful bread. What it is, is it's, it's unleavened bread. There's no yeast in it because when you're slaves and when you're trying to escape Egypt, there's no time to wait for yeast to rise. And so this is unleavened bread. This is, this is, you're moving quick. This is, you don't have a lot of money. This is the bread of our affliction. And so every single year at Passover, they say, this is the bread of our affliction. And then they have four get, uh, uh, goblets of wine. And each one is a different kind of salvation that God brought to them. And then the last thing is the, the shank bone of the lamb. And they put that on the plate. And this is the lamb sacrifice that, that was sacrificed instead of us. And a lot of people don't know that when Jesus brought his disciples together right before his crucifixion for what is called the Last Supper, what they were actually celebrating was Passover because they were Israelites. And when Jesus sat down with them, he redefined the elements of the Passover meal. And instead of the, the bread of our affliction, it was the bread of his affliction. It was his broken body, not theirs. And instead of four goblets of wine, he gives them one and says, this is my spilled blood for you. And there's no, there's no lamb, there's no shank bone. Why? Because he's the lamb at the table. And he redefines the whole thing and says, you won't all make a sacrifice. I'll make one sacrifice myself for all of you and for all time. Can I get an amen? amen. For all time. So Jesus redefines the Passover meal. Now you're starting to think it's like, oh, that's why we do what we do in communion. Yes. is because we celebrate the fact that Jesus was our Passover lamb. He died in our place. And so today we're going to celebrate 
the crucifixion. And that might sound odd wording to you, but that's what we're going to do. Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6, says it like this. It's the same concept. 700 years before Jesus Christ, Isaiah the prophet said, Surely he took up our pain. And he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, it was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Anybody relate to that? We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sins of us all, all placed on Jesus. Who's the him? The him is Jesus. Isaiah prophesied that this him, this person would come, the suffering servant would come and die for all of us. God would place all of our guilt and shame on him. So this morning, I want to take you step by step through the crucifixion of Jesus. Would you allow me to teach you something this morning? Would you allow me to teach you what it is to remember the cross of Christ? To stop and to focus. To lean in. This is your decision to make as an individual. Would you lean in today? Would you listen? Would you even feel what it is that the Lamb of God did for you. That's what we're going to do today. Last week, Pastor Ricky walked us through the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember? And and he showed us the garden where Jesus went and he sweat drops of blood. He, He prayed to God and said, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me because he did not... He did not desire the cross. He desired our salvation, but not the cross itself. And God, the Father, said there's no other way. And so Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And in in that moment, the battle was won. And so he leaves the the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's immediately uh, faced with uh, torches and soldiers. And Romans come, and they arrest him, and they're guided there by who? By Judas. You remember that. Judas is betraying him. One of the 12 disciples absolutely betrays Jesus in the final moment. And then Jesus is led away to three different trials all through the night. This is Thursday night. See Thursday night. And these illegal, in the middle of the night trials find Jesus guilty one after another. And then he goes to Pilate, and Pilate has him flogged, and, and Peter denies him three times. And Pilate has him flogged, and Pilate washes his hands of him, and, and, and the soldiers put a crown of thorns on him. And then they eventually put the cross beam on his shoulders, and they cause him to walk the road. They call it the Via Dolorosa road to Golgotha the place of the skull. So we're going to walk through this right now. I've got to tell you just one more thing about the flogging. When the Romans flogged someone, they used, it's, it's called a scourging officially. They used a device called a flagrum. It is not the cat of nine tails or anything like that. You've heard different things, I know. But it's the flagrum, and the flagrum was strips of leather and at the end of the strips of lever, and I'm not, I'm not going to be gruesome. This might be the most gruesome moment, and I'm not going to make you uncomfortable here. But at the end of the leather was um, uh, balls of metal for weight, and, and there would be shards of bone and glass uh, placed at the end of the leather because when they, when they flogged them and they whipped them, it would tear skin away and, and they would bleed. And, and it was so brutal that the Jews believed that if you whipped them more than 39 lashes, the person would die. And so they would call it the 40 minus 1, the 39 lashes. Jesus was, was beaten in this way. And what you're going to see is, is evidence as we go along through the story of this kind of shock to his system because of a great loss of blood. Uh, history, historians tell us many people just from the scourging alone died right there and they never made it to their cross. Jesus makes it to his cross, but I believe that he experienced something doctors call hypovolemic shock from a great loss of blood and hypovolemic shock. Let me, let me tell you what some of the symptoms of this are. Your heart races, your kidneys shut down. 
Lots of collapsing and fainting because you don't have the presence of mind and you don't have the physical strength to keep yourself up. Extreme thirst is your body requires more moisture into your body to replenish what you've, what you've already lost. And then something called a pericardial effusion, which is just a, a process in the body where as it's so depleted of, of liquid, of moisture, some of the moisture in your body becomes trapped around the lungs and around the heart. And the pericardial is the one that, that, that goes around the heart. And some of you are already thinking from your Sunday school days, this is why when the soldier pierced him in the side, not only did blood run out, but water ran out. The tears of the heart ran out as well. Because Jesus was suffering this level of shock. And you need to know that so that the story makes sense to us. The setting of our story, the place is Jerusalem, the capital city. The season is the Passover season. So not only would all the Israelites have flooded the city of Jerusalem, but also everyone else from the surrounding countries that were God-fearers, they would have traveled back. Their pilgrimage would have been back for the Passover, such an important feast. And it's Friday, Good Friday. And the time, it starts right before 9 a.m., and Jesus breathes his last breath at 6 p.m. Do you have the setting? Okay. So let's go back here. The first moment, as soon as Jesus begins to carry his cross, and can I have the scripture for that? Matthew, Mark, sorry, 15, 20. Then they led him away, Jesus, to be crucified. And this is his walk down the road. And a passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, what had happened here is Jesus had just begun taking his steps, and he was already collapsing under the weight of his cross beam. He couldn't make it. The soldiers have a job to do. They're not going to pick up that cross themselves. Why? Because technically it was illegal to crucify a Roman soldier. A Roman citizen was considered too important to ever be crucified. It was illegal to give them this kind of execution. It was reserved only for slaves. So your Lord and Savior was executed in a mode only reserved for slaves. So they wouldn't touch that cross beam that had fallen to the ground. And so they find this other foreigner who had come for the festival. His name's Simon from Cyrene. He's from North Africa. And they grab him and they force him legally to carry Jesus' cross all the way to Golgotha for him. And that's what happens. Jesus is so weakened at this point. It says that they led him away to be crucified. You see that he's walking at this point. Now let's go to the next slide. The grieving women. A large crowd trailed behind Jesus, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. What Jesus says to them is, listen, a time is coming and he's making a prophecy 40 years into the future, 70 AD, when Titus would come and sack Jerusalem and the entire temple would be destroyed. Destroyed. So many kids, uh, so many killed, such devastation. And Jesus is predicting that to them. And he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. This is the first of eight statements Jesus will make in the rest of the text today. In the first statement, you notice he's thinking about them, not about himself. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Ask yourself, why are they weeping? Why do you have a crowd marching behind Jesus and weeping? Let your imagination go there for a second. Because they love him. Because they have followed Jesus and they have known Jesus for three years now. And they have seen who he is. And they've come to not just worship him and follow him. They've come to love him. He's he's the one who gave sight to the blind. Gave hearing to the deaf. He didn't just raise the paralytic, right? 
He forgave his sins. And what did he do for women? He goes to the woman at the well and he treats her like an equal. Do you remember that? And he forgives her and he saves her and offers her the living water. Do you remember the woman who's caught in adultery? See the way that Jesus lifts even women up? The woman caught in adultery, he says, he was without sin, cast the first stone at her, which means none of you can. And he protects her and then he gets down at her level and says, where did your accusers go? She says, they've all gone. And he says, neither do I accuse you because the only one worthy to accuse her decided not to accuse her. Of course they're crying. Of course they're weeping. How, how dare they do this to him, to our Lord, who we love. You feel that? And Jesus is thinking about them. Next slide. Jesus is crucified. This begins at 9 a.m. This is from 9 to noon. Mark 15. And they brought, that word brought there, so important in the Greek, that means they carried Jesus at this point, by the time they get to Golgotha, Jesus is no longer walking, they're carrying him. This is how weakened he's become. He can't put one foot in front of the other to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Why would they offer him wine drugged with myrrh? Scholars tell us that Roman soldiers would sometimes do this at the beginning of the crucifixion process so that the victims would not fight as they're trying to nail them to the cross. They would numb them temporarily, and then the pain would really begin later on. Jesus refuses it because he wants to feel all of this, and he wants his head as clear as possible. So he refuses the drug. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross, and they divided his clothes through dice to decide who would each get a piece. And see that for a second, and this is what you see in the graphic here. Two nails, one for each wrist, and then one for the feet, and they're, na- they're nailed up there. Not only is there physical suffering, is there blood loss here, but there's asphyxi- asphyxiation. The way that they're hung there, it is hard to breathe. It's almost impossible to breathe unless you lift yourself up. It's a whole thing. And then they, yep, they bargained for his clothes. Verse 25, it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him and a sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews and two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. You need to see the purpose of the Romans here. They're crucifying him in this way on this low hill outside the main city gate and they're doing it for high traffic and high visibility because they have a purpose. Crucifixion, the, the, the point of it is that it would go on and on and on and it would be the most excruciating thing that you could imagine and you would get the message clearly, I never want to do that. I'll never cross the Roman Empire because if I cross the Roman Empire, they might do that to me. And so they put the sign above his head to say, this man claimed to be the king of the Jews and the only king is Caesar. That's what they're accusing him of. And you think he's so powerful? Let us show you how weak we can make him. And we'll surround him, one on either side, we'll surround him with criminals so that you see what kind of person this really is and what we really think of him. That's what they're doing. Next slide. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is the second statement of Jesus. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes, throwing the dice, and the crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed, and he saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah, the chosen one. They turned this into a debate. They're like, look, this proves he wasn't really God, he wasn't really king, he wasn't really anybody, because look, we're killing him. And you think you're such a big shot, Jesus, come down from the cross. Do you see how they're mocking him? They're, they're, they're giving in to this, this drama, this public display, and they're doing everything they can to shame him, and he just takes it. You saw that they gambled for his clothes. What does that imply? They've taken his clothes. He is not clothed at this point. Shame. He's mocked by everybody. He's abandoned even by his own disciples. The only one you'll see in just a moment is John that's there. Charles Spurgeon, in talking about Simon the Cyrene, said, why is there a Simon carrying his cross who is not Simon Peter? 
It's a good question. Where's Simon Peter in all this? Pastor Ricky told us last week, when he had denied Jesus the three times, Peter disappeared. Why? Is it because he's afraid? No. It's not fear. He denied Jesus and and he blew it at the most important moment. He's isolating in his shame. Can you relate to that? When we most fail God and we fail each other, don't we go off in a cave somewhere feeling so unworthy, feeling like we're of no use to anybody, and we just isolate? And that's what Peter was doing. He should have been carrying it for Jesus, but he was not. Soldiers scoffed. He saved others. Next slide. One of the criminals hanging there beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Next slide. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you'll be with me in paradise. So they're both mocking him at first. And then it's just one of the criminals mocks him. And the other one finally feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit and says, oh my gosh, I'm watching Jesus Christ, the Son of God, die. And somehow he gets spiritual clarity on what's happening on Golgotha. Can you appreciate that? He reaches out for salvation from someone on the next cross over who's also dying. If you're someone who intellectually needs proof that something's real, this guy is way beyond you. No offense intended. But you want to talk about a leap of faith. You're reaching out to Jesus at his worst moment when he looks most defeated. And he says, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. What kingdom? Only the miracle of faith in his soul could have brought him to that space. And he repents to Jesus and asks to be saved. And miraculously, Jesus says, yes. Notice how Jesus' phrases are getting shorter and shorter. He's got less air. He's got less mental ability. His thirst is is terrible at this point. He's using his phrases very wisely. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You will not go to purgatory and pay for your sins. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen? I love that. I love this picture. Jesus is dying and he's reaching out to the cross next to him. Next slide. We've got Mary and we've got John. Jesus provides for his mom. Standing near the cross were were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved, that's John, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, the disciple took her into his home. Jesus is dying. He's suffering the worst day of his entire life. And in the midst of this, he's thinking about his mom. When's the last time you called your mom? Right? Isn't this good? He's taking care of her. And why is she there? Because she's the one who had a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And she's been with him every step of the way. And you want to talk about a broken heart while she sits there and watches her son die? But she didn't leave. She's there. And Jesus takes care of her. And I love that John is there in the right place so that Jesus can do that. Next. The death of the lamb. So we just had 9 a.m. to noon, and this this all takes place between noon and 3 p.m. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock, and I'll just pause you right there. Three hours are about to go by. From noon to 3, it's complete darkness. This is a solar eclipse. We actually have ancient documentation of Roman historians that actually say they saw that solar eclipse take place on the same day in which there was an earthquake. 
the early church father Origen, quoted this other, Flagin is his name, this other Roman historian. A three-hour solar eclipse, and during this time, Jesus says nothing and nothing else happens. It's just silence. We're not told exactly what happens during this time, but here's what I believe. I believe that during those three hours of darkness, God was pouring onto the Son of God, onto Jesus Christ, the guilt of the whole world. I believe every punishment that was ever deserved for every sin that you and I have done, whatever the books contain on all our life choices and all of our selfishness and all the darkness that we've individually poured into this world, whatever the books say, it was all poured onto Jesus. All the guilt, all the shame, all the punishment deserved, all poured onto him for all mankind, for all time. And he didn't just, he didn't just see it. God made him guilty of it. He became guilty of it. He became sin, the scripture says, for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. It was placed on him. And as it was placed on him and as he suffered the punishment for that, do you know what the punishment actually was? The punishment was actually the separation from God that he began to feel the more guilty he became. Have you ever sinned and feel like you're just not very close to God? Ever sinned for a few years and feel like you're really far from God? Imagine the distance he felt. Because that's what happens. People ask questions about like, what's hell? Is it fire? Is it torture? Is God sadistic? Get all of that stuff out of your head. Hell is separation from God. And at once, you're like, well, maybe that doesn't sound so bad. No, 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 think about it. Because he's everything that's good. He's everything that's mercy and hope and faith and love. It's it's all in him. And if you were separated from it for a moment, you would know that's hell. Is us left to ourselves. C.S. Lewis said, hell is the gate that's shut from the inside and locked from the inside. No one gets sent to hell. We choose hell for ourselves. And hell was placed on Jesus for three hours. And it's so intense. And and he's a member of the Trinity. And I know we're not big. We don't talk about the Trinity a whole lot here. But it's like just these three friends These three beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that have loved each other for eternity and and, and they support each other and they know each other and they submit to each other and they got each other's backs. I mean, you, you delve into that, it will blow your mind. He's never not known that community and that fellowship. And finally, it breaks. And it breaks. And he's separated from the Father for the very first time and he shouts out, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani which is Hebrew, it's from Psalm 22. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 here, and they give you the translation, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It's a desperate cry. Next slide. And then Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. Did you catch that word? Finished. He has done it already. There are things to do. He needs to die. He, the resurrection needs to happen. But what he came to do is the sacrifice for our sins. It's done. And to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. And a jar of sour wine was sitting there. This is not the drugged wine again. He's going to accept this one. So they soaked a sponge in it and they put it on a hyssop branch so they could get it nice and high all the way up to his mouth, held it to his lips. And when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. And that Greek word there is Tetelestai, tetelestai. I don't know how to pronounce it. But in the ancient Greek, when you had a legal contract and a debt, and you had made all the payments on that debt and it was done, they would come to the end of it and they would write tetelestai, meaning the debt is paid in full. It's over, it's done. Contract fulfilled. And that's what Jesus says. Next slide. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. And then Jesus died. Next slide. 
At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And some of you guys know about that curtain between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple. And it was a symbol that people could not, they could not get into the presence of God, else they would die. And the reason they would die is because they were sinful and he was holy and they would just be struck down. And so as soon as Jesus died and it was finished, there's no more separation. So God makes the point by tearing the curtain in the temple. And the Roman centurion and the other soldiers at the crucifixion, they were terrified by the earthquake that happened and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. So not only is the criminal, the thief, saved that day at Golgotha, but also the soldiers. They brought him here to mock him and to kill this slave. And by the end of the day, they're saying, truly, and that's not just Roman officer, that's the centurion. It says, truly, this is the Son of God. They convert. They convert. Scholars believe that we know the exact quote there from that person, and we know he was a centurion because he was part of the early church and was telling his story to the gospel writers. Next slide. Jesus laid in the tomb. When evening had come, since it was the day of Passover, part of this Passover season, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the Jewish council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, he took courage. This was a big risk for him. He outs himself publicly as a Jesus believer and he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Next slide. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died because crucifixion was supposed to take a whole lot longer. Jesus had died early because of the blood loss. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he, in fact, was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. So this proves at multiple levels. Do you see it? That Jesus was for sure dead? Next slide. Joseph bought a linen shroud. And taking him down, he wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And I'm not going to run the ending for you next week. But it's going to be a pretty good week. You're going to want to be here for it. No spoilers, though. Why do Christians make such a big deal about the resurrect or the crucifixion of Jesus? Why do we do it? Why, why do we have Good Friday? Why do we call it good? Is it about guilt? Is it about, is it about violence and gore? What's this even about? What are we doing here? 2 Peter 1.8, I think, has the answer. In 2 Peter 1.8... And you've got to note that this is Peter writing this, by the way. Peter talks about a Christian and how a Christian should have all these heart qualities in our character. Right? Like we should be loving. We should be unselfish. We should be peaceful. And we should be patient with each other. And he lists off all these character qualities that Christians should have. And he says, not only should you have it, but you should be growing in these things. For verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective, unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting what they have been cleansed, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So if you're not growing spiritually, according to Peter, the reason is you forgot all this. The reason is, you were saved years ago. You got a testimony from years ago. You've been coming to church and you pay your dues and serve in the nursery. You're good. You don't need to think about that sin stuff anymore. You don't need to think about any of this anymore because you're good. Peter's like, nope, that's not how it's done. We need to remember. What do we need to remember? We need to remember that as bad as this is, it's what was deserved for what we've done. That's how deep our guilt goes. We we got a real way in our culture about looking out at all the destruction in our culture and all the destruction in the world and say, if only they didn't. Christians don't get to do that. We say, if only we didn't. 
If only we had not done this to our children, right? If only I had not done that to my spouse and done this to my marriage. If only, if only, if only, that, that's my guilt. I'm responsible for this world the way that it is. And Jesus had to die. And Jesus didn't just have to die. Jesus did die. And he did it completely. And I never have to go back. Amen? I never have to go back and try to do this myself. That's why there's no penance and there's no purgatory. That's like me trying to like die all over again. No. To remember this is to remember that it's done and it's finished. Don't come to church guilty. You're not guilty. You're saved. It's a different thing. I am not guilty. I'm saved because it is finished and his death was enough. Let's say you're a 16-year-old and you just got your license. 16-year-old shouldn't have a license, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole other thing. But you're 16 years old, and you just got your license, and you're king of the world, queen of the world, whatever. And so you go out joyriding in the family car, and you're having a ball, and you don't know what you're doing, but you're having a ball, and you wreck the car. <laughs> and you come back home, and you've wrecked the car. And here's the thing. If, if dad was rich, not so bad, right? Like, he just write a check. Ah, no big deal. Go wreck another car, right? But that's not your dad. Your dad's a blue-collar dad. And so your dad looks and says, I'll fix it. And you know what that means. Because you grew up in this family, you know what that means. What that means is he's going to work nights and he's going to work weekends. And it's going to go on for months. But he's going to take it. And he loves you. He's good. And so, okay. And what are you going to do while he's working all that overtime? While he's fixing the mess you've made? What are you going to do? Are you going to go into your room and play video games? Whatever, Dad. Thanks, I guess. Are you going to do that? No. No, what you're going to do is you're going to ask Mom, what time's he going to be home tonight? I'm going to wait up for him. And I'm going to say thank you. And dad, can I get you anything? Can I make you anything? Can I turn on your favorite TV show? What can I do? Dad, thank you. You see what you do? What you do is you say, the least I can do is I'm going to enter in. The least I can do is I'm going to think about it and I'm going to look at him do this for me and I'm going to walk side by side with him as best as I can. Why? Is it for guilt? No. No. Don't go there. It's not guilt. It's not guilt. Here's why. He doesn't want you guilty. You being guilty about it is paying for the thing twice. He's paying for it. He doesn't want you paying for it emotionally too. That's not his heart. He's doing this so you'll be free. See, that's a good dad. So he doesn't want your guilt. What he wants is your gratitude. Because when you're grateful... That's what Peter tells us. When you're grateful, you grow. When you're grateful, it changes you. Why do Christians look at the cross? Why do we remember? Because it changes us. Amen? Amen. Would you stand? I told you we'd have an opportunity to pray. And I know for some of us, uh, maybe we never understood it before. Maybe now the light bulb went on. Maybe we're ready. Maybe you've been waiting for an opportunity to reach out to Jesus and it's just not been there. So I'm going to pray this prayer and I'm going to give you a chance to be a part of this prayer. You don't have to pray these words exactly. God sees your heart. I love that, that thief on the cross, right? The worst sinner's prayer in history. He didn't get all the right phrases in there. He didn't even kneel down at, at the altar. But Jesus saw his heart, and Jesus can see your heart, and that's all that matters. So if you would bow your heads and close your eyes, and we're not going to track you or stalk you or visit your home, I promise. 
But as I go to pray this prayer, if this is your moment of reaching out to God, if this is your, if this is your life-changing, supernatural moment of giving your whole life to Jesus Christ, being forgiven for the first time by him, I'd like you to just briefly put a hand up. I'd like to know who I'm praying for this morning. Say, Pastor, include me in this prayer. I'm with you in this prayer. I want to give you a chance. Several folks are putting hands up. I'll just give you one more moment. Amen. Amen. So I'll just lead us through this phrase by phrase. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me. Thank you for the cross. You paid it so I don't have to. I'm done with my past, my guilt and my shame. Give me a clean slate. Thank you that you love me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me a new life. You're my Lord. You call the shots now. I give my heart to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.